Hello and welcome everyone to the annual homecoming speaker event hosted by University Programming Council in collaboration with Alumni Relations. My name is Ruthik Shah. Now I'm a senior mechanical engineering major here at UMass and I'm also the executive director of University Programming Council. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Figueredo. I'm the director of finance for UPC as well as a junior engineering major here at UMass. Tonight's theme is achieving success one snap at a time with Shahar Scott. Shahar is a highly reputed UMass alumna who is the current global head of brand marketing for Snap Incorporator, uh, Incorporated, or as everyone knows it, Snapchat. Today's program will feature a Q&A session where Shahar will answer a few questions that we have received from the UMass community. If you'd like to ask any questions, you can type them in the chat below and she may be able to answer them with the Q&A session after she speaks. A quick additional note is that today's event will be recorded and available for viewing at a later date. By participating in this webinar, you are given consent to be a part of the recorded session. And without any further ado, I would like to welcome Shahar Scott. Thank you so much, Chris and Rudvik, for the warm introduction. We're going to look back at this virtual homecoming and say WTF happened in 2020. Jokes aside, I am humbled that UMass Alumni Relations and the University Programming Council chose me to connect with all of you today to share a little bit more about my career journey. As you just heard, my name is Shahar and I'm the proud graduate of UMass 2002, which I am now realizing is likely the year that many of you were born or still in diapers. I am also the fifth person in my immediate family to graduate from UMass. In fact, my overachieving sister, Noga, not only got five degrees, yes, five, I know, from UMass, she also still works there in res life. My genius brother, Zeev, graduated from the School of Engineering in the 90s. He loved UMass so much, he stayed for the five-year plan. My siblings also met their spouses at UMass, both also alums. And my parents, Alex and Bacheva, mastered their areas of expertise and had tenured careers in the public school systems in Western Massachusetts. Both of them also obtained their PhDs from the School of Education. It's safe to say that we are loyal to the university and to the town of Amherst. When I was asked to be your keynote speaker, it was long before all of our lives changed. Life before COVID was chaotic enough, and yet I was so looking forward to coming back east to visit the campus and be with all of you in person. Alas, this is our new reality. Zoom call number 413 of the week. I'll do my best to make it the best one yet. Seeing as though we are in the midst of a global pandemic and one of the most important elections of our lives, I thought I'd share some glimmers of hope and learnings from my experiences. As some of you are entering the last year at UMass, while many of you might even be just at the beginning of your collegiate journeys. I certainly do not have all the answers, but my hope is that by sharing my story with all of you and how I've achieved one snap success, one snap at a time, as the title of this session suggests, you might find some common ground or a kernel of insight that will help you on your journey. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna take you through the last four decades of my life, covering the most pivotal life events, and then I'll happily open it up for any questions that you might have. So with that, let's dive in. Theme number one, roots run deep and they shape the tree. I moved to Amherst from Israel just in time to start preschool. My parents both wanted to further their professional studies. UMass had the best program and Amherst had the best public schools. So we moved with 10 suitcases, none of us speaking a word of English. As you can imagine, this experience changed the rest of my life. And it also taught me three critical things. The first is work ethic. I have an immigrant work ethic and mentality. In college, I worked three jobs as a paralegal intern at the law office of Joan Antonino and UMass professor Chuck Damari, as a waitress at Chili's Bar and Grill, and on the weekends, I worked at Kids Sports Gym. That was on top of a full class load and a very active social life. I've taken every work opportunity in front of me, always. That work ethic has inevitably led to my successes today. Being an immigrant, also taught me empathy. I don't take anything for granted. I know that everyone has different backgrounds and experiences that make them who they are. It makes me able to relate openly to diverse groups of people, and I'm always seeking to understand different points of view. The third thing that that taught me is the true definition of global. I have a worldly view on just about everything. To me, the world is not the town that I grew up in or the place that I call home today. 
For me, the world is limitless. And I encourage you to think about that as you build your career paths. Study abroad if you get the chance. I did in Italy and it was the best semester. Fast forward to today, as the global marketing lead at a small company called Snap Inc., my team oversees how we go to market in a particular region or country. When building marketing collateral and presentations for a global sales team, it means that we can't default to dollar signs, American spellings, or phrases. It's easy to forget that we're not the center of the universe. And now it's my job to make sure that we think global first. Before COVID, I was on an airplane every other week in a different country or state. My career has allowed me to see the world and I can tell you it's beautiful. That leads me to the second pivotal point in my life, finding my voice. What might not be so obvious to many of you as I speak eloquently, I hope, is that I actually grew up stuttering. As a kid, I struggled to speak and get my thoughts out into words when my teachers would call on me in class. I am eternally grateful for their patience. After years of speech therapy, I turned my disability into one of my greatest attributes, and I am now a champion for kids who stutter. I proudly serve as the chair of the board of directors for say.org, the stuttering association for the young. In addition, I've made a living out of talking. The very thing that could have stood in my way has honestly become my greatest strength. During my time at Apple, I got the opportunity to be presentation trained by Nancy Duarte, who was Steve Jobs' presentation coach for almost 25 years. I got better at my craft and gained the confidence to not let my stutter get in the way of my career. I encourage all of you to think about what makes you different from everyone else around you. Harness that energy in your gifts and turn them into your assets or secret weapons. Which brings me to the third theme and major life event. College years are like a four year long dressing room. Try things on. Fulfilling my ambitions as an experienced student was the highlight of becoming an adult. At UMass, I studied political science and I thought I wanted to become a human rights lawyer and save the world from its many injustices. After several internships and jobs in the nonprofit sector, I realized that I didn't need to work for the cause to be a part of it. I fell into marketing during my first job out of college and realized that it encompassed everything I was great at. Strategic thinking, brand building, problem solving, creativity, communications, growth, success, metrics. It was my language, but I wanted to master it. So I did that and I went to Columbia and got my master's in strategic communications and marketing. I share that story not to suggest that your major in college doesn't matter. I truly think it does but your career will take you to places that only you can experience once you are in those moments. And doors will open. And if they don't, then they're not your door. As your homecoming speaker, I would be remiss and likely never invited back if I didn't take the opportunity to plug higher education. You'll build even more lifelong relationships and grad school programs like the ones that you've already built at UMass and develop an expertise that only you bring to the table. Just ask my sister. That said, the School of Hard Knocks is pretty amazing too at teaching you lifelong skills. So if more education isn't for you, don't worry. You'll get plenty of real world experience just by living in adulthood. Which brings me to the fourth life event that truly transformed the rest of my life. Grit and adaptability make everything possible, even motherhood. I was lucky to meet my husband, Jason, while standing in line waiting to get into a bar in Boston long before online dating ever existed. Neither of us lived in Massachusetts at the time and we were both randomly visiting friends when we sparked up a conversation while standing in line at the place in Faneuil Hall. The rest is history. After getting married, we knew that we wanted to have kids. And so that journey began. Two years later, after several unfortunate heartaches and many failed attempts, I finally became pregnant with boy girl twins who are almost nine years old today. Morgan and Riley, they are my greatest life achievement and marker of success, and also the focus of my incredibly hilarious snaps. Because of my experiences and difficulties in getting pregnant and what I went through to become a mother, I've become resilient and relentless in my pursuit and my ambitions. I believe that anything is possible, and thanks to science, I know that it is. It also taught me that the most important things in life never happen as you plan them. So adaptability is one of those lifelong skills that will take you far in the workplace. The fifth theme that I think is worth sharing with all of you today, take a risk on tacos. Introducing the taco truck, rewind time to 2008, food trucks didn't really exist on the East Coast. 
My husband is an entrepreneur in spirit and at heart. He had a great idea, bring authentic Mexican street food to Main Street. Being a marketer, I helped him build the brand for the taco truck, and we brought that idea to life and to the world in New York, New Jersey, Philly, and also in Boston. Becoming an entrepreneur was pivotal to my professional career. I learned the true definition of being scrappy, of raising capital, of making mistakes, having mishaps and enduring failures, and how to turn them into learnings and actual business opportunities. I also learned that risk is a prerequisite for success, just like my parents risked everything to bring all of us to America. This is where my confidence comes in. I also learned the importance of doing what you love and finding the passion behind a company's mission statement, a product that you just can't live without, or as a consumer of an industry that you wholeheartedly believe in. It makes work fun and feel like a privilege on most days rather than a job. I used to say that I moonlit tacos because while the taco truck existed, I had another full-time job, not only as a mom, but as a head of marketing strategy at Apple. I led the launch of IAD, the very first advertising platform that Apple ever had, and the original pioneers of mobile advertising. I also worked on the launch of iTunes Radio, which is Apple Music before it acquired Beats. And I often say that I got my PhD in marketing while I was at Apple. I commuted to Cupertino, California for that job from New Jersey. I did it weekly for almost three years. So when I say that I view the world globally, I mean that. And lastly, the sixth theme that I'll share with you today, purpose drives everything. We made the decision to move to LA for SNAP four years ago. My family was deeply rooted in New Jersey. Our social circle was there as well as most of our family members and all of our friends, but a door opened. So we chose to walk through it and relocated to LA. In doing so, that also meant that we had to close other doors, specifically those at the taco truck. I joined Snapchat days after we IPO'd. I was hired to build the marketing team from the ground up. And in doing so, I built a brand and a platform that is used by more than 249 million people every single day to communicate with their best friends. Hopefully, all of you are some of those 249. I've learned something each and every day during my time at Snap. Our company's values are kind, smart, and creative. While that may sound totally elementary, they're actually really powerful words. When I say kind, I don't mean being nice to people, although that's important too. I mean be courageous, tackle difficult situations with optimism and confidence. Kindness requires having empathy for others and gaining the trust of your colleagues through honesty and your integrity. Smart doesn't mean an Ivy League education or a high IQ score. It means being action oriented, taking on new challenges with a sense of urgency. It means having excellent decision making skills, knowing when to say yes, and more importantly, when to say no. Creativity is easy when you get to play with augmented reality all day, but it also means adapting quickly to changing conditions and cultivating new and better ways for your team to be successful. It also means seeking new approaches to problems that require solving. These are the values that are not only important to me and SNAP, but this is the stuff that most companies will look for when they're sourcing new talent. At SNAP, I learned what it means to manage under ambiguity and make things happen even when they seem impossible. I've hired a global team, some of whom joined SNAP during the global pandemic that I've never even met in real life. I learned to surround myself with people way smarter than I am who can tell me what we should be doing as a marketing team to achieve our objectives. I've learned that the only thing that is constant is change and to thrive in that chaos. I've had to reimagine what marketing is in a virtual world where we can't meet our clients, the creators on, on, within our Snapchat communi community in person anymore. Where a virtual experience not only replaces a physical one, it has to be even more memorable. No one could have predicted COVID. So we adapted and we still found ways to achieve our business goals. In fact, we eclipsed them. I've seen our industry change and people wake up to the importance of privacy, brand safety, acronyms like GDPR and GARM. But the most important lesson that, I've, that I think is worth sharing is I work for a company whose mission I respect and product I love. In order to understand the consumer, you need to be one, and I am. I bleed yellow, and Snapchat has fundamentally changed the way that I communicate. I usually talk through bitmojis and pictures. So enough about me, let's talk about this global pandemic. Just kidding, sort of. I know you're probably all sick of talking about it, hearing about it, especially since we're all living through it. But that's my point. 
while none of us can unlive this wacky and sometimes devastating experience, each of you can use this opportunity and leverage it to your benefit. This new reality brings more opportunity than we think. It's broken down so many barriers. You're in my home right now in LA with me. I'm in Evan Spiegel's home with him every week as he addresses the entire company and answers their questions about politics, working from home, and the future of computer overlaid on the world. Think about that for a minute. There are far more interesting people in the world than me. And guess what? They're all also at home right now. Use this new reality to connect with people that historically would have been unapproachable, unreachable, or just too busy to get a cup of coffee with. The entire world is on a level playing field for the first time ever, and maybe the last time too. Take advantage of this opportunity and be bold in your outreach to future employers, future mentors, and future connections that will champion you in your career. Over the last 20 years of mine, and even the 20 before that, the most important thing that I cherish in my life are the people that I've had the privilege of meeting around the world, the lifelong friends that I've made in Amherst who I still keep in touch with today, the amazing colleagues I work alongside and mentor at every opportunity I get, and especially the person that I ended up marrying and building a family with. If you take one thing from me today, and hopefully there were a few nuggets of wisdom, build bridges, because you never know when you'll get the chance to meet that person or what role they'll play in your life once you've met them. As you chart your path and start interviewing for jobs or deciding what summer internships to apply for, make sure it's for something that you love with incredible people. But even if it's not the ideal dream job scenario, that's totally fine too. Treat each work experience as an opportunity to get more adaptable, to communicate better and in more innovative ways and learn to be resilient. When interviewing, talk about the time that you live through a semester while remaining physically distant from your peers, your professors and friends to demonstrate your resilience. Remember that risk is a prerequisite for success and that you didn't let this pandemic get in the way of your collegiate experience. Use these months of hardships to craft your story about turning this experience into your greatest strengths. Make your ambitions so great that you thrive in the process of achieving them. And eventually you get end up asked to speak at your alma mater for homecoming one day. So in closing, I'll leave you with six things. Your roots run deep and they ultimately shape the tree. Find your voice and use it boldly. College is like a dressing room. Try lots of things on before you find the perfect fit. Grit and adaptability are the keys to your success. When in doubt, take a risk on tacos and know that purpose drives everything. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much UMass Alumni Relations and UPC for inviting me to come back and be with all of you today. I'll now happily open it up for any questions. Thank you so much for that. I think it was amazing. And thanks for sharing your experience with all of us, because I think it certainly inspired all of us here today. It's amazing. I, I think it's amazing how you worked in so many great companies and st still been able to kind of be connected to your roots, as you said, uh, with, your, with your entire family, Stale Amherst and stuff like that. I think it's great. And uh, we really appreciate having you here today, of course. And moving on, I think Chris and I would love to ask some questions that we have received from our UMass community a little ahead of time and just a few also in the Q&A section. So I'm going to quickly hand it off to Chris to start off with the questions for today. Thank you, Rufik, and thank you, Shahar, for, uh, for speaking tonight. Uh, our first question is, what has Snapchat done to initiate positive change in the world? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, they, we do a lot. Um, I'd say that right now, when we're all physically distant, um, Snapchat is the fastest way to communicate with your best friends. And right now, there's literally nothing more important than connecting with people that, that you care about and that you miss. Um, while we remain physically distant during COVID. So um, we've, in addition to that, we've also registered um, over a million uh, first time voters uh, for this upcoming election. Um, and we're continuing to innovate the way that people can communicate. So I'd say that we're doing a lot, um, but, but most importantly right now during, during this time, we're connecting people at a time where they just feel of, you know, very, very far away from their family and friends. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think that's fantastic. I think it's always important to have that connection still going. Uh, another question we have from the audience is, 
given how you've made a number of big pivots in your life, personally and professionally, what primary factors do you think have helped you best to adapt to the change of going from job to professional and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it adaptability, I know I said that a bunch, but, but really at taking every situation and trying to understand what the opportunity is and then overachieving on that is, is something that I've always done. But, but for me, it, it has been just an incredible journey because I have gotten a lot of opportunities. I've made a lot of connections and they continue to stay in my life. And a lot of the, the jobs that I ended up um, getting and also taking were ones that, that the, the door is open because of people that I've met. And um, along that journey, I've also brought people with me from one job to the next. So uh, that that is also very important. That's why I said build build bridges because again, I think that's that's how most of the doors for me at least have opened. Awesome, we love to hear that. Uh, hear about your experiences. Our next question for you is: What is a skill that during college you didn't realize would become extremely important throughout your career? Um, I mean, oh my God. You know, I'd say like never burn a bridge is is one thing that, you know, you meet a lot of people, you decide to do a lot of things in college, but I'd say that never burn a bridge. You never know when that person is going to be sitting across the table from you again or in a company with you again. And um, I have a, a funny story. I, I worked at an agency um, a long time ago and I left that 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 job for another opportunity. And years later, I was on, on a flight to Austin uh, for a big industry event called South by Southwest. And the former founder and my former boss was sitting next to me on that flight. And you know, if I had left that company on bad terms, that would have been the worst five hour flight, but it was the best five hours. We caught up, uh, we're still friends today. And you know, I just say like, at you know, in college, you're making lots of plans and lots of decisions and you're making tons of connections. and the most important thing is to hold on to the ones that that really matter, but but don't burn a bridge. Yeah, I think that's very important. As you said, you never know who you might run into at any point in your life and they can even help you in the future. So I think that's really important. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, how have you worked on improving yourself uh, with any weaknesses you thought you might have throughout your career? How do you think that's helped you uh, become the person you are today? Yeah, I mean, I have worked with executive coaches throughout my career. Um, that's been an incredible asset and, and benefit is having somebody else who cares about your career, but is objective and will hold a mirror and, and shine a bright light on the things that are amazing and also um, that are areas of development. But I just say, like, I have a growth mindset. Um, you know, I'm never done learning. I'm never done growing and I won't ever be. Um, I think that's why I love working so much is I truly mean what I say. Like I learn something new every day, not just about my industry, but like how I am as a manager and what it's like to be my colleague and feedback is a gift and take every one of those kernels of um, generous, you know, honest and um, carefully, hopefully crafted feedback to to grow. But yeah, I've definitely sought out executive coaches, um, still work with one today. And that's been a critical part of how I've been able to really grow and, and scale my, myself and my career. Awesome. This next question relates to that, uh, that sort of area. Uh, the question is, what's the best way to brand yourself? That is a great question. Um, authentically. <laughs> Um, you know, I was asked to speak today and, um, I just shared my life story and it was easy to do because it, all these things truly happened. So I would just say, you know, tell it like it is be authentic. Um, don't make shit up, you know, um, that's really important. So I would just say, yeah, definitely be, be authentic, tell a story that is true to who you are. And also, um, that is interesting. Um, but you know, be authentic and, and practice. It's like, we often forget how important that is, but practice also positioning yourself and practice like interviews and how you'd answer questions and always be prepared for 
questions that you didn't um, anticipate, but I would just say, like, be honest about what you've done and how that's helped you accelerate your life and your career ambitions. These are yeah, good I think, questions. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question, which is kind of on the same kind of theme, but uh, someone in the chat asked, uh, do you have any advice for more seasoned fellow alumni who continuously are seeking to develop their own personal brand and grow professionally in their careers? I mean, it's the same thing. I think, you know, use your work experience that you've had uh, to really craft a story. I know that the the, the whole world right now is shifting and, and industries are thriving right now that didn't eight months ago and others that were eight months ago aren't. And so I would look at what's what's working right now in the world and, and see if there's a role or an opportunity for you that is exciting and interesting and, and checks off all the boxes that are important to you. But I, I would answer it the same as um, for an undergrad or, or a new graduate is you know, tell the story, thread the needle between all the different work experiences, life experiences that you've had and demonstrate how those are applicable to the job that you're applying for, the company that you're hoping to seek a role at is, you know, draw those connections, connect all those dots so that they really understand who you are and tell a great story of what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think a lot of us will appreciate that, even for us with uh, just uh, about to leave uh, college. But going back to your college days, if you could go back, what would you have done different or would you have done anything differently and why? Such a good question. And hindsight is 2020. But um, no, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I had like the best four years at UMass. I loved every second of it and I wouldn't change a thing. And, you know, everything that happened then, um, without even knowing it, led to my success today. So 100% not changing it. Just wish I could go back. <laughs> yep, definitely. I think every, everyone who once graduated wants, wants to come back. I don't know the feeling yet, but hopefully I want to come back to UMass for sure. Like a weekend, you know, not, not like forever, you know, just for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> a few memories. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, the next question we have is, for your first marketing job, how did you signal that you were hireable when your bachelor's degree wasn't related to that specific field, as you said? Yeah, so my first job um, was not specifically a marketing. It just that I kind of fell into it while I was on that job. So I was working for John Kerry, um, who was running for his fourth senatorial race a um, long time ago, and that was before he ran for president. So I had the opportunity to join his campaign and um, I actually led the women's rights issues on his campaign trail and got to meet his wife, Teresa Hines and Hillary Clinton and had the opportunity of, of helping craft the messaging that he would deliver when we were in field educating voters and constituents and Massachusetts residents about the issues that matter to him. and. So that is how I literally fell into marketing. I didn't realize that I was doing marketing at the time, but um, I was. And, you know, crafting a narrative and telling a story and trying to persuade people that is marketing. And so it, it was, you know, I, I was a poli sci major, thought I wanted to go into kind of human rights, politics um, as well, and tried that out. And the rest is kind of history. But one thing led to the next and I realized that that was marketing, which is really cool. That's great to hear. Uh, you talk a lot about how you really love your job and you have a passion for it. Uh, do you believe it's important to turn a passion into a job or keep your hobbies separate from your career? Depends what your hobbies are. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think if you can make money doing what you love, like then of course that, then doesn't feel like a job, right? It feels like you're doing what you love and that's super important. So it, it really depends on what your hobbies are um, and if you can monetize them, then for sure. But, you know, we all need a break um, from sitting in front of a computer and working or traveling for work. So I would also encourage you to like keep them separate if, if that allows you to 
fill yourself with energy and kind of motivation to come back to the office. And um, yeah, I mean, so I, I would just say like, it really depends on what your hobby is, but I would definitely consider or encourage you to look into it and understand what is monetizable within that hobby that you could either coach or teach or create products for or innovate that industry, depending on what it again, it is. Um, in order to make that a living. But yeah, sure. I think um, that that is the dream, but that's also why, you know, I, for me, like marketing, it's definitely not my hobby, but I love it, you know? So when I'm at work, um, the majority of the time is, is a gift and it doesn't feel like, you know, work. It's what I'm meant to do. Yeah, I think that's great. I think everyone wants to do something they love. Like no one wants to just work because they have to work. I think that's very important, as you said. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the next question we have is, uh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to be an entrepreneur, but doesn't exactly know how to identify an opportunity when they're presented with it? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I mean, the first thing that I would encourage you to do is, is do research. Like, Make sure that what you're um, incubating or what you're ideating around doesn't already exist. Um, even if it does, um, that's okay. You can always make it better. Um, you know, it, actually at, at Apple, most of the products that they go to market with weren't first to market. They were just better versions of what already existed. So, um, you know, as you're looking to become an entrepreneur, um, build a great team around you. Uh, you as one person cannot do everything and you need to surround yourself with people that, that augment your greatest strengths and can help you build it. Um, but the first thing is to establish, you know, product market fit. So make sure that what you're inventing um, is truly needed and talk to those people and socialize your idea with them. Make sure that it's something that they believe will actually work or fulfill a need that they have. And once you have that kind of initial gut check, um, you know, start, start making it. And if that means writing a business plan or if that means actually like prototyping it, it just depends on what it is. But um, definitely research would be my number one recommendation is make sure that you really understand the landscape and what's around it so that you can uh, make it better. Awesome. Uh, even as, you know, personally as an engineering major, I, uh, I very much appreciate that, Ayla, that advice. Um, our next question is, how have you been able to find a work-life balance uh, during this pandemic? Uh, there is no such thing as a work-life balance. Um, that is fake news. Um, I just think, you know, you have to do what's right for you. Um, and no one's gonna, especially now that we're not just working from home, like I live at work, right? So you're in my, what used to be our guest room, um, now is my office, but um, you know, I have two kids, as you know, and it's important for me uh, to be able to hear them in third grade and, and, and see what they're doing next door. Um, you know, I, I work a lot. I work a lot of hours. I'm sitting in front of this desk, sometimes 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Um, and other days, you know, I'll take Friday off because I just worked a 70 hour week and I need a break. But, you know, I'd say that there is no such thing as work-life balance. You have to create that for yourself, depending on what you need, um, make time for yourself to work out. Um, we're not commuting anymore now. So fill that commute time with other things. Uh, but certainly, you know, figure out what, what you need. If you need to work for 20 minutes and then go for a walk for five, like figure out your own schedule so that you can do those things. Um, because there isn't anybody around me to tell me, go take a break. Um, and even when we were in the office, I would say the same thing. It was self, self-imposed self and self-inflicted as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that definitely makes sense. We're all trying to find the right balance and to see what works for all of us. But yeah, uh, the next question I have is kind of two-phased. Um, what advice do you, would you give to students who are still uncertain about what they want to do in their professional career? And also kind of going, just going off that, uh, maybe what, what advice would you give someone who's entering the job market right now with such limited opportunities out there? I mean, I think there's a ton of opportunities. I just think that um, they might be different from what you originally 
thought you were going to do. And I think that's okay. Um, again, like no one could have predicted what was happening right now. And I actually think that there is a ton of opportunities. There are new jobs being created all the time now. I mean, and, and even I would say like at Snap, we've, we have still grown during the pandemic. So companies are definitely hiring. I think some that are obviously having a very difficult time right now, reinventing their businesses or adapting to what is really the new reality and what might be the new future, um, the new internet age, if you will, where remote working will probably last for a long time, or at least the option to work re remotely will. Um, you know, I just think broaden your your view. Um, the 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 exact job that you thought you were going to do may, might not be available, but jobs that will help you lead to that one or similar industries or similar companies or competitive companies, um, uh, you know, could be hiring. And, and I think there are a ton of great job sites out there, obviously LinkedIn, Indeed, um, Glassdoor. I know that Acorns just launched um, a new job site in their app. So I think people, ZipRecruiter is another one. So I, th I just think, you know, cast a wide net obviously have a LinkedIn page. That's really important. That is the first place that any employer goes instantly and tries to understand what your background is. Um, but yeah, I would just say cast a wider net. Like it, the exact job that you thought you'd be doing might not be available, but other ones that are close or will lead you there probably exist. And and I, I do believe that um, the the opportunities right now are different, but they're, they're plentiful. So touching a little bit on your own experience, uh, what surprised you the most about starting a professional career in the tech industry? Um, I mean, I'd say the rate of innovation is, is, you know, continues to amaze me. I wouldn't say it surprises me, but you know, at, at Snap, for example, we, we built an ad ecosystem, an ad platform in two and a half years, uh, what, what, what took Facebook and Google, for example, um, 10 years. So I just think machine learning is changing everything. Um, innovation is accelerating. And that for me is why I love the tech industry and, and marketing within the tech industry. So I, I don't think anything surprises me, but I'm always just very impressed and amazed at how quickly problems can be solved with innovation. And I would say like, I guess the one thing that did surprise me is like working from home. You know, I never thought that that would be not, not only a possibility, but like mandatory essentially. And that location just wouldn't matter anymore. I mean, we truly had to get on an airplane to have meetings and now you don't anymore. And I think that is going to forever change, um, not just the tech industry, obviously that one in particular, but I would just say in general, how employers are going to be looking for talent. Yeah, I think that definitely is going to be a long-term change and situations like these cause that. So I think that's definitely how it's going to be for a while. Yeah, uh, next up we have a kind of question that would kind of help us look at more into your work, uh, which would be what marketing campaign that are you most proud of and why? Um, so we just actually, my team just launched um, a campaign that I'm super proud of uh, called Meet the Snapchat Generation. And so I'm using that one as an example because, you know, we it's, it's actually still still in market right now. That was a global campaign it ran in 10 markets. And it was a Herculean effort. And the reason why I loved it was it was at, we, we, we launched it in August and we launched it during a global pandemic. And so we launched it at a time where production and how we thought we were going to make the creative, like totally all those plans just were out the window and we had to reimagine it. And so we actually sourced snaps from real Snapchatters. We created a story and films from real clients uh, shot on this device, you know, in the comfort of their own homes. And we pull together an incredible campaign that is generating a ton of positive momentum, changing brand lift and sentiment and all the things that we would have 
aspired to do uh, pre-pandemic. And that hasn't, you know, stopped us being able to launch it. So I would just say that I'm proud of it because it's working. Um, and it was telling a story that that was really timely for the advertising community where they needed to understand this audience and how they were going to help them recover their businesses once things started or will start to open up again. And the generation that is on Snapchat is more likely to go out to dinner. They're more likely to eat at restaurants and go to fitting rooms and try clothes on again. But what we've done at Snap is we've actually brought all those experiences through our app um, and through AR. So um, we just kind of told that story again, authenticity, and and it's working and it's resonating, which is exciting. So um, production has not slowed down, which is which is crazy, but we've just had to reimagine how we bring that to market. So for our next question, uh, we've had someone submit a, a sort of scenario and asking for suggestions. So the question is, I, ran a, I run a 124 year old organization that is in a rebranding re process, including a possible name change to coincide with our upcoming milestone of 125 years. Any suggestions you can share that we should pay particular attention to? I love this question. I actually, you know, I think rebrands uh, can be incredible for uh, telling a story, but also for future proofing a company. So I've actually led two rebrands in my career. The first of which was actually for an organization that had been around for a hundred years and had 90,000 members around the world. And before we embarked on that journey, we talked to those 90,000 people. And we made sure that we brought them along that journey and that we were authentically telling what, you know, this organization was and did it in a way that, that again, like future proofed it for the next hundred years, um, but didn't take away from all the incredible work that had already been done. So I, I would say like, number one, uh, bring people on that journey, understand who your key stakeholders are and make sure that they're part of the process and don't just present them with a rebrand and say, we did it. Um, they need to be part of making it. Um, the second rebrand that I've been a part of was actually at say.org. When I was asked to join the board, the organization had been around for a number of years and it was called Our Time. And I you know, was honored that Taro Alexander was the founder of Our Time asked me to join the board, but to me, our time sounded like a dating app for elderly people, um, which in fact it was, and they would get phone calls for from parents um, whose kids stuttered, and also of people that were upset that their profile wasn't working right. So we embarked on a rebrand and through a, an amazing process that, that landed on us um, finding say.org as an available URL, and that acronym meaning what the actual organization did and what we stood for. I mean, we future-proofed that organization that has now grown from being just in New York to being in Australia, to being in LA and Houston, Texas. Um, we've got kids that come in from Egypt, like literally all over the world. And I don't think that that would have happened if it was called Our Time. So I think rebrands can be incredible. They're, they're a valuable tool in your marketing set, but they need to be done with a lot of thought and consideration and bringing stakeholders on that journey. It's critical. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's some great advice. I, I, I personally haven't done any rebranding, so I wouldn't know, but I think definitely would, uh, definitely some great advice for that process. Um, Next up, just taking it back a little to COVID, um, how have things at Snapchat changed uh, with COVID, like the, the work-life balance, as you said, um, and do you have any tips to kind of keep your team motivated? Because you said you work with a lot of teams and a lot of projects. So do you have any quick tips that we can kind of implement even in our own um, groups and clubs on campus here? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, Snap did an incredible job, I, I'd say adapting very quickly to what was happening. Um, and the first thing that that happened was there was constant communication from Evan and the executive leadership team to employees about what was happening and what was, you know, like how SNAP was going to support 
employees through this. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, for parents who were all of a sudden teachers as well as workers. Um, it was also for people that were isolated on their own um, to make sure that they were okay. And of course, people that were actually impacted with COVID themselves. So um, Evan started a weekly uh, Q&A called Ask Evan, um, and that's actually evolved into being Ask Exec. So every week, every Wednesday morning, the whole company dials in and it's a, it's a total open forum. There's literally no question that that goes unanswered and people can ask him and the executive team anything. Um, we've also increased the number of emails that have gone out from the executive team about benefits. So they, they upped coverage and they changed the number of programs that we had access to. They created an online family series for parents of kids that are very young with like music classes. So I think, you know, every week they're doing something else. Uh, we, we celebrated our nine year anniversary um, a couple weeks ago and they threw a virtual concert with Earth, Wind and Fire. Um, you know, I think they're like literally inventing how they support us depending on what is happening. Um, another thing that they're doing is on November 3rd uh, for the election, they're giving everybody the day off. They're encouraging people to volunteer at the polls and giving people the opportunity to um, participate in their civic duties. So every day is different. Um, I'd say that the frequency of meetings has gone through the roof. Um, we are trying to communicate more often, make sure that people are okay and gain alignment. But we just went through our planning phase for next year and we did that all remotely and we'll continue to be effective. But I, I just think that we're, we're inventing it like in real time and we're figuring it out as we go along. But I think that all companies are doing that. And from what I hear, they're doing incredible things to support employees and even just from onboarding new employees, making sure that they have everything that they need at, at, at home uh, to be successful has also been really important. Okay. So uh, the next question uh, for you is, what is one piece of advice that you would tell your undergrad self? Um, oh my goodness. Um, that is such a good question. You've stumped me. I don't know. I mean, I'd say like, Shoot, I honestly don't know. <laughs> Pass, sorry, I'll, I'll think of something clever and come back to it. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I think we would all stump sometimes, but uh, just another question I had was that how, like, what do you think now is your next step? Um, you, you, said, you said a lot about how you've worked in different companies and you've got a lot of different kind of ideas about what you, what, what you want to do in your future, but what do you think now is your next step and what goal do you think you want to achieve going, going forward? I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, that, that, that goal and ambition like just changes all the time. I have no idea what's next, uh, but um, you know, I've had an incredible career and I, have again, like just made so many connections throughout that process that um, who knows what's next? I'm excited. I mean, who who has a crystal ball that can tell me what's next? Um, you know, I, I think again, like it's opportunities present themselves and then you have to evaluate them and understand what what the benefit is and is it gonna help you achieve your your goals? I'm I'm constantly re defining what my goals are. So the things that I'm interested in evolve and change. Um, but I would just say like every opportunity that you take in your career is a lily pad. Like you might leap on that lily pad and decide to stay there for 10 years, or you might hate it and move on. Um, so don't be so hard on yourself and figure out how much time is enough for you to stay somewhere and get everything that you can out, out of that experience before you move on to the next one. So touching a little bit uh, on that, uh, how can we stand out as applicants when applying to jobs and internships at well-known companies like Apple and Snapchat? 
Um, great question. Um, you know, I'd say like do research, like find out what is important to that company. Um, I just shared with you, you know, our company values. You can probably Google every company that is public, what their company values are, their mission, their vision, and make sure that you're including those those words, you know, in, in how you communicate uh, about yourself and make the connection uh, for the employer about why you are the best person for that, that, that job. Make sure that you're applying for something that you're truly qualified for, or if it's a reach, like be honest about that and say like, I am great at half of these things, but I actually have never done these things. So is there going to be an opportunity for me to learn how to do those things? Uh, don't, don't pretend that you know how to do everything. I don't think anybody expects you to. So I would just say, um, you know, be very strategic in how you talk about yourself and uh, do your research and make sure that the company that you're applying for, like you've done your homework on what matters to them and what they care about and make sure that you're standing out from your resume. Um, I think the LinkedIn profile is definitely one, one variable, but a resume matters. So take time to make that one unique and differentiated from others that you're seeing around online. There's some great templates that you can like download and buy, I think even on, on, on Etsy, for example. So just find something that really brings who you are to life. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, that's great advice. Yeah, just the last question we have for today, which kind of ties into the piece of advice that you give to your undergrad self, which kind of might help you <laughs> ask that question a little bit too, is uh, what skills do you think would be important as an undergrad to kind of have, it doesn't matter like, across all the jobs, across all the, I think, I'd say majors, what do you think is the one thing that every person should learn uh, should get before they get into like the real world job scenario? Hmm. Um... I mean, I, I would echo what I said before, I think, which is build bridges. Um, no matter what industry you're going in, if it's medicine or tech or retail or restaurant, hospitality, like you are gonna be working with people every single day. Make sure, and you're spending more time with those people than you are your friends, your family sometimes. So really make sure that you are loving those people and yet you're making connections. Again, like I, I can't emphasize enough, like the number of times that people that I've worked with in the past or experienced something with, I've reconnected with in the most unexpected places. And so, you know, I've, I've maintained those connections. I've, I've kept in touch with people because I know that someday down the line, like either they or me will come back in, in contact with them. So. Don't burn bridges, uh, build, build them um, and, and make sure that, that you're taking you know, the, the time to get to know people and make an impression, make a good impression. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's good advice. I think it's, as you said, even earlier, uh, how you met someone after like 10 years at, on the plane, that would never happen. Like, like the chance of that happening were really, really low, but still happen. I think that's important to make sure you always keep building your bridges and expand your like, connections, I guess. But yes, so I think that brings us to the end of the event. Uh, I would like to thank Shahar so much for the wonderful event today. And it was a pleasure to have you this evening. And a big thanks to everyone as well for attending the event. I hope you all enjoyed it because I most certainly did and learned a lot from you. Thank you guys so much. It was my pleasure. Uh, for all of uh, the attendees, uh, for more information on events uh, happening this week, uh, you can check us out on social media at UMass UPC. Uh, you can also find out more information uh, on the UMass Homecoming page, which is linked on this QR code on the slide. You can pull out your phone, scan in, it'll ring you right there. Uh, finally, we also have a, a quick um, survey. Uh, if you'd like to give us any feedback on the event, uh, we'll put that link in the chat box right now. Um, but other than that, thank you all for attending and to go UMass.